blowing fire into the tunnels. They're blowing fuel on the fire. No, it's not that. Okay, I think we're ready to start the last one. I don't want to hold you over too long since we're running a little bit late here. And this is the last one of the day. And then <laughs> is that because you're happy to see it uh, finally come to an end, or what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Finally, this is over. Yay! <laughs> well, I'm Tom Valone, and I'm uh, here to talk about zero point energy, non thermal, and thermal energy harvesters. I guess I'll go to full screen so you can see more. More is always better, as they say on the commercial. Okay, there we go. And I think the um, webcam is working, and we also have a microphone for the people at home. <clears throat> and I actually have some notes from a paper that I published, and I'll reprint in the proceedings, too. So, okay. Um, basically, this is an entertaining slideshow. I avoided the video stuff that I had a couple um, examples of. But essentially, what I've, um, uh, I've done is updated for this year. This was actually given at the uh, Naval Strategic Study Group. Um, we had one Naval commander here earlier today. Um, but um, uh, just pointing out that this also has interest to the military, obviously. And that's why I'm pointing out the Naval Studies Strategic Studies Group. Um, and the controls here will get me to the next picture. First of all, of course, I have to introduce our institute. We are focused on energy, propulsion, and bioenergetics. Um, I regret to say that bioenergetics wasn't represented too well in this uh, particular conference. Propulsion had a little bit, but energy was the main focus. So, but we do have projects and proposals in every field. Our books are actually up to, um, all in the NPA uh, lobby for sale. And the reason why some of this is work is being done is thanks to Jim Hansen, this graph actually is a big motivator for me. I met with Jim Hansen at a conference where he was a keynote, and I gave him a copy of the very next graph I'm about to show you. But I thanked him for this one because it was because of his work that this graph was actually produced and published. Um, no one ever knew what the temperature was for the past 400,000 years. They knew what the um, sea level uh, was and also the um, the three variables that are on there, the average temperature, the CO2 level, uh, was easy to measure. But the important part here is when you put them all together, they seem to correlate and tightly uh, match throughout all the years. And so what I was interested in, of course, is the anomaly that's happening recently in our century. And so I got to the next um, compilation that I assembled to show Hey, what happened before, what's happening now, and jeepers, we're up to 400 uh, parts per million uh, this year. Now, nothing to celebrate, because it's really bad news. <laughs> we're hoping never to get here, but uh, nobody could stop it. Um, and that is a big issue. But even as an inconvenient truth, when um, Al Gore goes to this utility lifter to point to this, because this is a big, huge graph on the wall, um, he didn't explain, and I told him this when I met him, uh, he didn't explain what does that 400 parts per million mean. Well, this graph tells you. It actually is a, um, a correlated graph, uh, calibrated is the word, uh, to actually um, identify what these horizontal lines uh, signify. And then I produced this key just by taking out a ruler and, and taking a look how many lines are there here. So uh, that piece of should be in about 140 degrees Fahrenheit under every step. No, no. Yeah, it, really? uh, no, the actual precise number is 4 degrees C, and or 7 degrees F. And we're indebted for because of the fact that these three variables track so tightly. In other words, if one goes up, the other two go up to meet it. That's what history has proven for half a million years. 
and, and you can track, uh, you know, any one of them will lead at any one time and the other two follow. So my issue was, what does this 400 uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide mean in terms of temperature and sea level? That's all I really am asking. And the temperature obviously is scary. Four degrees C means we're already indebted to that no matter what we do. But CO2 has to come down or stop going up just to ensure that we only go up to four degrees C. And of course the sea level rise, nobody believes. I didn't believe it either. So what 80 meters it turns out is Antarctica and Greenland. Those are the two landlocked glaciers. It takes hundreds of years to melt. But Greenland's worth about 10 meters and Antarctica is about 60 meters. So 70 meters of that's actually accounted for. That's how bad it is. Um, the interesting thing is the 4 degrees C was questionable. That was 2006 when this graph was published. Well, what came out three years later in 2009? The 4 degrees C warmer. <laughs> yeah, the International Climate Committee finally catches up and predicts the same thing. Jim Hansen was way ahead of his time. That's why they were trying to fire him. That's why they fired me in 99 for Kothi. I'll tell the story of the banquet. Um, but this is interesting how the truth comes out sooner or later for different reasons. You know, they, they calculated it, obviously. Well, this is also an interesting um, slide because this introduces the next one, and that is, hey, there's some national security reasons why this should, should be a concern. And this report actually that was issued in 2007 paints a very interesting, I met with this uh, Frank Kip Bowman who was on a panel with me here at the United University of Maryland actually, dealing with this topic. And a uh, uh, very bombastic type guy, you know. And he was in charge of the Nuclear um, Institute, Nuclear Energy Institute. So, of course, he only wants one type of nuclear energy and doesn't care about the waste. In fact, you know what Bowman said about nuclear waste? He says, oh, it's only one little soda can for every person in the country. Well, you shouldn't worry about that. <laughs> Literally, that's what he told the audience here at this university. I was going, oh, my God, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take that and bury it in my backyard. I guess so. That's what Bowman thought. This <laughs> is so simple, you know. Okay, go well, back to the topic at hand. Uh, the Pentagon thinks a little more seriously about the issue. And, um, and so I got invited to, as I say, the strategic um, the studies can, uh, group um, in the uh, Newport, uh, Rhode Island um, uh, Institute. And, and these were the people that stayed behind for the picture. But it was a full room. For three hours, they had to talk about zero point energy, which was great. You know. So here's the lecture condensed to give you sort of a summary. And that is zero point energy is real, reported in 1997 as the first laminal experiment that actually succeeded to do uh, conductive plate um, experiments on the Casimir force. And the Casimir force, of course, is the most um, uh, macroscopic way of telling you and us that there's something there. There's something real to the quantum vacuum, and the proof is when you get something very close together you start exceeding or um, ex uh, excluding the um, wavelengths from the outside, which are plentiful. You can uh, speculate how many frequencies and what the upper range of those frequencies are. <coughs> but inside, uh, everyone can agree there's a very limited number of frequencies that will be able to be uh, existing within a micron of space. And that's literally the space it has to be or smaller to have the Casimir force take off. And it's a very um, exponential force, by the way. Well, Casimir deserves all the credit. He actually um, got um, an exponentially increasing number of paper sightings since he's published his original paper in 1948. And, um, and that's sort of interesting and, and significant because uh, it shows the, the scientific value of him being 50 years ahead of his time. And of course, many other people have talked about it as well. Uh, Sparney is also cited there too. Um, and NASA's interested. NASA's done uh, various uh, work and we have to give some credit for it. I did a PhD uh, thesis on it as well. And I was kind of excited to look at the practical and the historical um, uh, aspects of zero-point energy. The historical is here. These are all the people that I credit for having done work that contributes directly to the knowledge we have today of zero-point energy, including Fabrizio Pinto, who was one of our keynote speakers at a conference on future energy a few years ago, 2009, I believe. 
and Frank Mead, who's a good friend, um, who also has a patent, which I may or may not uh, show, um, depending on which slide survived in the uh, cut, cutting room. And of course, Heisenberg deserves a lot of credit. I was fortunate enough to meet his son at one of the physics conferences years ago. And stupidly, I asked his son, did your father ever um, express any regret for discovering the uncertainty principle? Because <laughs> I'm an Einsteinian, you know, through and through. I always think, we, we should be able to know what's going on. There's, there can't be so much randomness that you have no idea what's going to happen next, you know. Anyways, of course, he was a very strong German. And he said, no, absolutely not. So, <laughs> defending his father until death. <laughs> so I gave him credit for fighting me on that point. And of course, Einstein has been proven wrong all these years, so we still have, um, the, I would say, the jury is out about whether there's hidden variables and things like that that might help uh, bridge the gap between relativity and quantum mechanics. So, and then Dirac is also a, a great hero of mine. Um, it's hard to figure out whether he really discovered the positron, because he discovered there's a negative sea of energy that's filled, but he really didn't tell what happens when you create a hole in that negative energy sea. But the hole ended up becoming what we now call a positron. And it's, it's interesting to look at his original writings, because you don't really know if he knew what he was talking about. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> um, what we should give credit for, and I hope his name was previously in those pictures, is uh, Max Planck. Because Max Planck, of course, issued his first radiation law. And the circled area of 1 half HF was missing, totally missing. So there was no vacuum energy, and of course, it didn't correspond to reality. <coughs> but his second law, he said, oh, i got to put in the fudge factor, much like Einstein with the cosmological constant. And, um, and all of a sudden, it did matched. And the interesting thing is, when you go to temperature zero here, 1 over 0 is infinity and so forth, and crap, um, basically cancel these out, you end up with 1 half HF is left. That's the only thing left at zero temperature. So the fascinating part is this has a physical effect even at those micro degree ranges that um, lots of different experiments have proven now, like liquid helium. Liquid helium has been down to micro degrees, less than one degree uh, absolute, and it still remains liquid. So there's lots of interesting um, uh, books. This is probably the best textbook I would uh, recommend. In fact, this book convinced me to write about it and investigate it further because of Milani's uh, incredible number of articles he wrote, which he put all into separate chapters in his textbook. Um, he basically explains very convincingly spontaneous emission. And that, to me, was a great eye-opener. Because all the time I thought that the quantum vacuum was doing all the spontaneous emission, it's really half radiation reaction and half um, spontaneous quantum simulation. And of course, the amazing fluctuation dissipation theorem, I actually explained it pretty well on the YouTube video that's online. So that was at a Tesla conference, and I went into detail. But I'm going to skip that today, because I really want to get to the practical end of things. <coughs> but that's another proof that zero-point energy has to exist. And, uh, and this is a fascinating one I haven't figured out yet, but there are physicists that understand it better than, uh, than me, of course. And it's the unruh davies or davies unruh effect. And that is, if we have uniform acceleration, it looks like temperature. It looks like a temperature change. And that's, to me, a very good engineering clue that maybe you can get energy from the vacuum, even in that sense of an unruh's davy um, acceleration. And that's actually been experimentally proven. There's an experiment now that actually uh, achieves a very fast moving mirror and, and therefore measures the temperature increase. So a lot of these have actually been experimentally advanced into areas that, um, that show the quantum vacuum is, uh, is real and also has uh, practical applications. And this, to me, is the real future. That's why I uh, titled the book on that uh, issue as well. <clears throat> One issue that I'm very fascinated with right now is inertia being a zero-point field. Uh, to me, that is an eye-opener for space travel. Uh, recently, just this week, I read a new scientist that the um, um, rover on Mars has measured too much radiation. And therefore, they're concluding the whole trip, if it takes a month for uh, astronauts to get to Mars, they'll expose them to more than a lifetime worth of radiation. In other words, the upper limit that NASA puts mm -hmm. in seabirds. So it's not good news, but I'll explain, if I get to that slide, 
the uh, inertial shielding theory I have that actually has been uh, corroborated by some black project people. Brown State, this is an interesting put off uh, article, and they actually were supposed to do some experiments to prove it. The um, uh, issue is very similar to what Haitian Modell talked about, and Modell was here just last year explaining his experiment putting noble gases through a casimir tube. And it's fascinating to me because as you do that, you basically change the boundary conditions much like you do with the casimir tube, casimir plates. And therefore, the atom is seeing something different. The levels are supposed to drop and release energy. And that's exactly what Modell measured. So the atom probably does the same thing as the neon, xenon, krypton that Modell works with. Extracting heat and energy. So these are all fascinating articles and probably worth um, pursuing individually. <coughs> Here is Frank Mead's patent. A very fascinating patent. This took me, I actually devoted a lot of uh, pages in the practical conversion book that I wrote on this patent because to me it was intellectually challenging. And the interesting thing was I call up Frank one day to ask him about this patent and he and this other fellow, um, uh, Nach Hamen, Nach, Nach um, I'll take one more uh, guess at that, Jack Natchumkin. Um, patented, and essentially they were competing now on the rights to it. And so as I explained, uh, I inferred that this um, uh, two spheres um, would probably work better as they get smaller, because that's the way zero-point energy works. The smaller you get, the more powerful it is. Um, and, and probably if you used like a couple of neutrons or a neutron and a proton, because they could be slightly different size, they would probably be the best. And he got silent. He said, well, that's, that's proprietary. <laughs> so I thought, gee, I'm onto something. That's really cool. I just guessed, you know, I was right. But, um, but he's trying to protect that information. <laughs> so, um, OK, we're moving on to another fascinating field. And this is just a couple examples. Yes, there are theoretical and experimental proofs that zero-point energy can provide propulsion. We are talking about space travel, folks. Get excited, get ready. Um, this is a very simple experiment in phys, uh, Physical Review Letters, 2004. And the, uh, Dr. Fiegel, who basically was the first physicist to use zero-point energy to satisfy energy conservation, actually does the calculation of putting a strong magnetic field, 17 tesla, um, high um, electric field gradient, and then getting a movement in uh, dielectric uh, fluid. So it's interesting that those two fields actually are producing movement, even though they are stationary fields. <coughs> so that's, of course, what we like is solid state converters of zero energy. And got to give Einstein some credit, too, of course. Um, and this is the story I told, I think, last year. Yeah, last year we gave uh, Dave Goodwin the um, Integrity and Research Award. And the story goes on this particular event here. This was December 1998, um, as this article comes out, talking about breakthrough of the year, accelerating universe. Well, behind this whole story was, uh, I believe it was, I may be wrong, um, Saul, Saul Putterman? Anyways, it's, it's a um, UCLA physicist who actually, astrophysicist, who got a grant from the DOE. But he got a grant from Dave Goodwin. <laughs> and the interesting thing was, Dave confided to me at the Joint Propulsion Conference, he says, you know, as we're walking down the hall, he says, you know, I decided to go against the grain and give this grant to, what's his name, uh, UCLA. And it turns out he discovered the, um, the universe was expanding. <laughs> accelerating in its expansion. That's the clue. That's the breakthrough we're talking about here. Not only expanding, but accelerating outward. And it was because of Dave Goodwin's grant. And, and he said all the referees said not to give it to him. <laughs> that was the interesting part of it. Only I knew the, that part of the story. You, know, you can't mention that in the government, of course. Um, but I figured, hey, he stuck his neck out because he really believed in something, and he saw something the other referees didn't. And it turns out Dave Goodwin was right. And that's, that's a brilliant insight. And you've got to give him credit, as well as the guy who did the discovery. So, OK, well, here's the uh, two slide summary on what I feel is an incredible breakthrough. I even showed the slide at the disclosure uh, hearing 
um, citizens hearing downtown in, um, in DC um, just a few months ago for the uh, National Press Club. And the reason I showed it is, as you research this um, paper, H. Redder and Putoff uh, published in uh, 1994, basically they tell you that not only will the zero point energy produce a force, but it's a magnetic Lorentz force. And all the physicists know that's a simple classical force. But are we actually showing the equation? Why, yes, here it is. F equals V cross B. And it's in the uh, quantities that are related to the quantum vacuum. And here we see, once again, the Davies unruly effect. And this is, of course, the, uh, the clue or the key to the whole thing. Resistance to acceleration is really a Lorentz force due to the Davies unruly effect. It sounds complicated, but it's really simple. And to me, this is all of a sudden a clue. It's like the light went off in my head when I saw magnetic. Because that means that it's possible that the Lorentz force that we're seeing, in other words, when you read this pattern, when you read this article, he's basically looking at the human body or a plane or a ship or a spaceship or an airplane all as electromagnetic charges. And it's moving through a sea of electromagnetic charges. And as you change uh, direction or you accelerate, you encounter resistance. Because those uh, forces, the Lorentz force is designed to measure both, uh, velocity and, and, and respond to acceleration. So that's kind of a simple explanation. But to me, I felt, hey, this means there must be um, a, a possibility of an inertial shield, inertial mass shield. There's no reason inertia mass and, and gravitational mass are the same. Uh, equivalence principle, I even had another lecture on it yesterday in the NPA. The equivalence principle was something that Einstein invented. Because he said, well, measurements uh, on Earth seem to show it's the same. Well, they're, they're different quantities entirely. And, um, and the interesting thing is, of course, I got a little A here that belongs way up there. <coughs> but you get the idea. This is F equals MA. And this is only inertial mass we're talking about. Well, we just discovered the secret of inertial mass related to the quantum vacuum. So what if we can change M by some type of shielding? Then it's very possible that A could go up, and you'd have the same amount of gasoline or rocket fuel or, uh, as I hope, electrogravitic forces to, to cause that. And that's why I'm describing the, the shielding inertia is the key for not only radiation for charged particles coming into a ship, you know, a shield, they become massless as they go through the shield. But more importantly, you can get a, a very rapid acceleration. And of course, there are plenty of examples from uh, various uh, photographs. This one, I'm sorry for the overlay here, but the photographer is actually a personal friend, or was a personal friend. And um, it was taken outside Stewart Air Force Base at uh, 2 AM in the morning with a 35 millimeter camera and a tripod. And still, stars are actually seen in the photograph. Um, if you look closely, and I can even email the photograph to you, there's some stationary stars. And what's happening? Well, Turns out, as you open the shutter, a triangular craft was going overhead with blinking red and green lights, and all of a sudden made a right angle turn. Duh. How did it do that? <laughs> and then I realized, oh, I made a wrong turn. OK, well, let's go back and keep going outward straight. No visible contrail, no, uh, no noise, no inverse Doppler effect, audible or low engine noise. They even videotaped it as it passed overhead and had US insignia. Black project thing, but hey, folks, this is what's going on. So anyways, I've shown this to the National uh, Reconnaissance Office Deputy Director. He acknowledged that it's probably real. And he, as I asked him, can you declassify this? Come on, can you help? You know, we really need it. We want to use this stuff. Civilians need it. And it was at the Space um, uh, National Space Conference where they were talking about, you know, he was there giving a lecture for NRO saying, we need major muscle moves to get our satellites up every month. You know, who's he talking to? There's a bunch of folks out here that have no idea how to do that. You know, but I caught him as he's going out saying, hey, here's your proof. If we can get this declassified, I can give you your major muscle moves every month. <laughs> you know, it won't take very much muscle. That's the point. And so you know what he said? And I've written this up many times. He says, well, you know, an invention like this is basically uh, highly classified. It always becomes more classified until it's out of sight. That was his exact phrase. He says, it's cheaper for us to reintroduce it to a private contractor who then will rebuild it and, and reclassify it. 
at a lower classification. And I said, you mean taxpayers have to pay for it twice? And he says, yeah. <laughs> so that's the story, folks. And then, of course, we have to give credit to Dave Froning, who's done decades of work on using the quantum vacuum for propulsion in the way of comparing the speed of light and speed of sound. And amazingly, just this type of comparison gives you, you know, amazing similarities between the equations. <clears throat> so you start to understand why Froning is so motivated to believe that hey, the speed of sight, the speed of light, is probably exceedable by some electromagnetic means, which he's working on with non abelian electromagnetic charts. <clears throat> but he has um, uh, Terence Barrett working with him to get a good quantum mechanical um, understanding and vacuum engineering that's needed to make this successful. And they've done some measurements too with the toroids. I'm just hoping he'll be successful, you know, in this lifetime to be able to actually produce some <coughs> model or example that actually works. Um, but he has lots of simulations. And, and the interesting thing is he's already proven that the zero-point energy field drag that we saw in the Heche, Beretta, and Putoff article starts to get lower and lower as you approach lower temperature. And then I always ask the audiences here or anywhere in the world, what's the temperature of outer space, kids? About three degrees K, right? Well, could you ask for a better medium for getting the zero-point field lower in drag? No. I mean, it's like outer space is like, um, designed for this type of invention. You know, they're really compatible. That's, that's what you learn from this type of theory. So that's exciting. It means our future could be so rosy and bright that we have to wear sunglasses. And we see articles like this every so often. This is one from Aviation Week Space Technology, almost 10 years ago, of course, that maybe zero-point energy uh, could be the uh, extraction that we need to get into space faster. OK, I'll move things along because I do have too many slides, as I usually do. But the interesting thing is that we talked about attractive Casimir forces. Well, what's the story on dark energy? Have you heard that they failed to find dark energy anywhere in our solar system? Dark matter also failed, and that's more measurable. In other words, if there was any ounce of dark matter anywhere in our solar system, there would be some type of aberration in the astronomical movements of the planetary bodies. And recently they did a new article showing to several decimal places the measurements of all these um, bodies in the solar system, and there were no aberrations. So it's like our solar system is completely free of dark matter, which doesn't make sense, because it's supposed to be like three quarters of the universe's energy in dark matter, and you know another tooth, uh, another good portion is dark energy as well. Uh, the issue I'm pointing out, and this has been not only me, but many other people have said this, is that repulsive galaxies probably are getting repelled by the same force that the cosmological constant is, was originally based on, and that is the universal quantum vacuum. And, and here's the proof. Repulsive Casimir forces have been measured, and it only depends on the temperature. So, and that's kind of interesting. So there's got to be more quantum physicists that will work on this project on an astronomical scale to help answer the burning question of where all that dark energy and dark matter is. And this one I would like to skip over because it's not really um, a generator, even though this was an attempt by Robert Forward to broach the subject. Um, he failed because this ends up being a battery and more like a storage battery than any type of extractor because it can be uh, compressed and essentially doesn't excite the vacuum in any uh, way, shape, or form. <coughs> but as we move on to something similar, the Pinto um, engine cycle optically controlled one has a very interesting um, end ending uh, sentence in his paragraph where he says, free energy production could be achieved. <laughs> But it's interesting that he would say that and actually get it published in physical review. So we gave him a lot of credit when we finally met for actually sneaking that in there. And the way he does it is to design a very interesting cavity. And see, what I did in my practical conversion book, which is actually in the bookstore, is I have a whole page of toolkit suggestions. 
line by line, all these different tricks that the vacuum engineer of the future can just pull on off the shelf and put into his experiment. One of them is turn a light on. If you turn a light on, as, uh, as uh, Pento proposes to do in this experiment, immediately the Casimir force changes instantly inside that cavity. How much does it cost to turn a light on? Probably very little energy. How much energy do you get when your whole um, cantilever moves a lot? And that's the secret of this whole invention. The cantilever moves, it's a charged up uh, capacitor, and you get a, a few uh, microjoules of energy for every cycle. And it's about a half a nanowatt, and this is a, a micron size, 100 micron size um, converter. So I keep asking, when is he going to build it? When are we going to build it? Well, you've heard me talk about Model a few times. Well, Haitian Model actually deserved a lot of credit for this patent. And it came out in 2008, but Model didn't do the experiment uh, until just, I think it was last year, about a year ago. And this is fascinating to me because it actually seems very similar in theory as the PAP engine. And so I think there's some similarities between the two of them. Here we're talking about billion tunnels of uh, tiny 100 nanometer size, in other words, approximately a micron size casimir cavity. It has to be slightly less than a micron to have a casimir effect. And you're, you're forcing any one of the noble gases through them, uh, or a mixture. And, and Model did each one individually. He thought he would get the most energy out of xenon, because it's the heaviest. Instead, he got the most energy out of helium. <laughs> so it was a surprise to him, actually. But to me, this is interesting because you've got noble gases, you've got pressure, and you've got energy release. And as we saw from the PAP engine uh, video, uh, the same thing's happening there as well. And so I had this, some of these for the military guys, you know, show national monuments in Washington, D.C., while I um, prime them with interesting things about the Casper cavity. So, and this is kind of a good quote. You know, gas passes into the cavity. A range of modes is restricted. The gas sheds some of its electromagnetic energy. And the energy is available locally. So you're getting global energy available locally. And this is kind of interesting. You know, is the quantum vacuum conservative? That's been a debate throughout history, actually. Um, Forward was one of a defender that it can't be, you know, it has to be conservative, it can't be a source of energy, even though he published his, you know, an idea for it. Well, here, Hayes explains very nicely that once the gas flows out from the Casimir cavity, the orbital energy is recharged from the quantum mechanical vacuum. Harvested globally, delivered locally. I like that. That's a gas station of the future phrase. <laughs> you can see that, the zero point energy for, uh, fuel uh, recharging station. Yeah. So, and the conclusion is, we're affected, uh, extracting energy locally and replenishing it globally. And this, to me, is a guiding principle for any zero-point energy uh, concept of the future. Imagine extracting thimbles full of water. Of course, I'm showing the Potomac next to the Washington Monument. But um, the ocean's being depleted, yes, but no practical consequences ensue. So we hopefully will see um, his prediction. He should put a... a I'm sorry, Haitian model um, uh, prediction come true, and uh, we're certainly aiming in that direction. Well, there's been plenty of articles, and I don't need to go into each one individually as I like to when I have more time, but zero point uh, quantum fluctuations are seen even in macroscopic circuits. And this to me is exciting because some of these circuits may be similar to the Kohler invention, who knows? Uh, there's certainly a few coils there and a few capacitors. So this might be worth reviewing. Physical Review Letters, Volume 84, Number 2, January 2000. And it does have very persistent current uh, predicted, average persistent current. In decreasing external impedance, the fluctuations exceed the average persistent current. And that's sort of what we want in any type of zero point energy converter. So I get to the recommendations. Hopefully, nanodiodes will be something we should aim for. And I'm actually looking for the nanodiode and even the quantum diode as, as the hope of getting a solid-state converter available. And that's what the finale or conclusion is all about here. And this is work that was done by Christian Beck. I'm sorry, this is done, cited by Christian Beck, who I actually corresponded with. But it's really um, Koch or Koch. 
I suppose Coke is a good name for KOCH, University of California, Berkeley, 1982, who did the original work from 10 to the 10th, in other words, 10 uh, gigahertz up to uh, a terahertz. And he's basically showing an increase. Uh, dashed line is Planck's first law. The dark energy is, um, if, if there were va uh, no vacuum fluctuations, the data would have gone down into the data, uh, dotted lines. So instead, he actually measured um, uh, significant energy spectral density uh, in Joseph's injunctions that were cooled down to um, superconducting uh, temperatures. So he eliminated all the thermal energy to see if there was any zero point energy contribution at these very high frequencies. So this has been a debatable area. You know, can you measure anything past maybe, uh, you know, 5 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, or whatever? But here he's, he's getting up into the terahertz, which is very exciting. Um, sometimes they even uh, speculate that you can get into way past X rays and gamma rays for zero point energy, of course. But the infinity has been a problem wherever you deal with zero point energy because it seems like you could go on forever. And if you do, then the equations sort of fall apart. Well, when I, when I approach any concept of fluctuation and diode work, um, uh, I'm actually faced with the same issue and, and conceptual problem. And that is, do I focus on thermal energy or do I focus on non-thermal? Well, I like to include both. And the thermal, obviously, is a lot more prevalent and a lot more robust at temperatures that are like room temperature. So you can have lots of different examples. The Brown patent, 3890161, was an inspiration for me. It's an expired patent, but at least shows the basic idea of putting lots of diodes into an array. And presumably, each diode would be a converter of some uh, relative uh, level of use useful electricity. Um, this was another one that I probably should have shown soon, earlier, but it basically shows NSA and uh, Army Research has been involved in this research, too. Ah, here we go. In case you were wondering what thermal energy is doing right now, that's what it's doing, jiggling away. And the question is, can it be rectified? Well, yes, it can be. And the first um, proof of that is Morizuka's patent, 5930122. And as you study that, he uses a backward tunneling dial. Um, the interesting thing here at the United, uh, University of Maryland, there's a Professor Dagenet who I'll cite very quickly. He is actually using a regular tunneling, tunneling diode with an antenna. Well, Morizuka talks about using backward tunneling diodes because the turn on voltage is zero. What more benefit could you ask for for little tiny oscillations that don't like any gaps to go over at all? And of course, this little uh, tunnel gap is about all you can expect that zero-point energy would be able to jump. And it actually does. They actually have um, uh, diodes and transistors where quantum fluctuations cause the conduction. In fact, DARPA worked on it. Noise equivalent power is pretty high. Thermal noise is a really good contribution. Um, there was a state conference a few years ago I went to, and I actually have the paper on negative energy um, that basically talked about the fact that resistive wires could be a good source of this type of random fluctuation. Uh, and there was a, a fellow they were following, I think from Brazil, that actually had done a lot of coil research trying to rectify uh, standard wire type conversion uh, oscillations. Well, here's the slide describing Professor Dagenet right here. I invited him to come to this conference, but he has too much money and probably too many grad students, so he's too busy. <laughs> But sooner or later, we'll try to um, correspond with him, because I love the research he's doing, and it's very similar to the type of work I'd like to do as well. Did and, you ever hear from him? Nope. Oh. Never did. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just expecting he's in his own ivory tower that's very successful. And, and of course, you keep reading about articles that um, you know, praise his work. And the interesting thing is he's up at the terahertz range. Um, at least, that's his goal. Because obviously there's more energy to be had up there. <clears throat> and I don't know exactly what his density of diodes are, but I really like the idea of putting antennas that are suitable for that frequency. Because then you're going to get, you know, much like that um, energy sucking antenna, <laughs> or the black hole antenna, as I call it. You know, you're going to get a lot more energy coming in to one diode that you've invested money in uh, than if you didn't have the antenna there at all. <clears throat> so, yeah. It's, and oh, here's the uh, website. 
Um, in fact, I thought it was cool electron, cool CAD, cool CAD electronics.com. Yeah, because he does CAD work as well. <coughs> and he's already achieved 20 gigahertz rectification. And this is basically from um, uh, thermal thermal noise. So the, this is a fascinating field to work in because nobody believes it's possible. <laughs> and, you know, it's even more fun when you don't want to need competition. Who does? He works on rectangles, really? Wow. I'll have to call him up. Oh, fascinating. Great. Well, he's a hero of mine. He's done some amazing work. I, I forgot to correct these little anomalies. These should be uh, square root signs uh, to show the, um, the root hertz um, energy density. But this is just a compilation of, of three different um, uh, graphs, one from a textbook showing white noise uh, available in the uh, low frequency to relatively high RF, and showing how constant it is in the white noise range. The 1 over F region is, is famous when you study noise, uh, low frequency. But the uh, noise up here is very interesting because it's proportional to the frequency. So as you get higher, of course, you're going to get more power. And can you rectify it? Well, that's where the uh, Coke work from 1982 seems to show that you can keep on going past 10 to the 7th. You can go way up to 10 to the 12th and it keeps increasing. And then as you can see, 1 over F is just the opposite when you're at very low frequency. So textbooks agree the noise is available. And this would be my final um, type of uh, proposal, is following the Kuriyama patent and the Hastis patent, you find, uh, the Hastis article rather, the idea of um, getting high density 10 to the 11th dials per centimeter squared. I mean, that to me is a, a wonderful goal. Of course, you don't want to start there, I would think. But both of these, uh, one patent and one article, talk about very similar densities. And, um, and neither one is describing their usage for rectifying thermal or non-thermal energy. But the concept of even having such diode arrays, I think, is uh, exciting. And of course, in flat screen TVs, we already have that. So the technology exists. It just is not being utilized as a passive receiver. And of course, we did a little bit of work in this area. I also calculated the concept or the amount of energy that we could expect in the picovat range, and assuming a 10% efficiency. And, um, and then the zero-point energy spectral density, interestingly enough, comes into the same order of magnitude. So it's, it's fascinating to me that zero-point energy still is a contender for the uh, source of energy. And you've got to figure, as you get out into space, it'd be nice if zero-point energy could also provide some electricity. And, uh, and so you get this energy density of 60 picojoules per electron is the approximate uh, answer. That's thanks to Milani as well. So my goal is, and at the uh, Naval Academy uh, Studies Group, I passed around sugar cubes to everybody. Because they're one centimeter cube. You know? So I said, here's your generator of the future. <laughs> and I said, where's the LSD? <laughs> but um, I said, no, that's the, this, is, this is just an example of the, um, of the possibility of having a, a one centimeter cube and therefore generating sizable energy. In this case, we're estimating perhaps 5 watts up to 50 watts in that range. But the idea is very um, uh, defendable. And it seems that there's been a good list of people that have already uh, seen diode conversion of thermal energy. And in fact, one of them is me. <laughs> I actually grabbed some Radio Shack diodes and found that um, they were not only a constant current source, which was very surprising to me, because as I kept putting resistors into the series, I wasn't getting any change of current. Um, but when I finally got up to 10 mega ohms, then I could compare my uh, picoammeter. It was telling me I had you know, 2.2 nano amps. And I was able to compare that with the um, voltmeter as well. And in fact, that should be probably in the next slide, perhaps. Yeah, yeah that's where I compared it. And I got 23 millivolts across. That should be an ohm sign. It's only a blip of PowerPoint. And the same 2.2 or 2.3 nanometers. 
So the standard voltmeter, digital voltmeter, as well as the PicoM meter were telling me the same current was being produced just by a bunch of uh, series of diodes sitting there. So, and Keith Lee already predicted this years ago in one of their tech briefs. And I just happened to have that. I was looking at it. I said, this is amazing. People have known this works, that LEDs can also be a source of energy, but nobody's made use of it until just now, recently. Those are lamps, light absorbing lamps. That's right. Very good point. <laughs> and of course, this is my messy lab, two views of our electromagnetics research laboratory. And these are some uh, ideas and constructions of Tom Schum, who's, who is here in the Washington, D.C. area, and gave me a lot of suggestions and obviously these slides, too, to um, encourage me along the way. And he provided his data as well. So um, in conclusion, there's a lot of different uh, research, if we really just concentrate on zero-point energy, in terms of the microsphere, nanosphere, picosphere, and then, of course, femtosphere, where you get into atomic densities and sizes. But, of course, the key for um, uh, zero-point energy is you get the highest density as you make it small. And so it's a very attractive, for engineers, I would think, it's a very attractive field to pursue because hardly anybody's doing work except for Garrett Modell and a few others that, um, that warrant citation. However, all of these papers and the titles fall into those different realms of electromagnetic, mechanical, fluid, or thermodynamic conversion. And, um, and, and it's fascinating reading. I think it's an indication of where we're going in the future. And we'll probably see more and more examples of what we would call energy harvesters, because this is exactly what we're talking about. We're energy harvesting not only thermal energy, but the non-thermal quantum vacuum. And so we can foresee that the goal of, um, of, of many people for the future is that we should have a, a cube box. And it's interesting, Bernard Hayes came up with the, the 10 cc cube, just as I did for my converter, as the ideal size to work with. 10 cc seems to be the, the perhaps the, the volume you want to fill with a converter that will do anything. Of course, we're all Jetsons when we start with this idea, or Star Trek fans. But, of course, we can't travel through space without this. And, um, and, and that's why I feel it's our destiny. And, and the research proves that this is actually real. Noise amplification. Refrigeration effect is very real. In other words, as we convert thermal energy to electricity, we should find that we're cooling the environment. So for global warming, this could also be very helpful. Very helping people. And two independent verifications of zero bias diode arrays have surfaced as well. Now it's even more. For further information, quantumfields.com, zpenergy.com, earthtech.org, and my book, Zero Point Energy, Fuel of the Future, available on Amazon. And we want you to help build Green America. And also there's a proposal, too, and that's my other book, Practical Version. Any questions? How are you doing, Pat? Yep, too good. Too good. Any questions from the vacuum engineers in the field? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Well, thank you for your attention. Oh, of course, we're still live, so yes, you can have a question. No problem. The one was dealing with with the turning on the light in Casimir cavity. Yes. Um, uh, another one uh, is a good example, and it's in the practical conversion book, is you can actually use a parabolic dish to concentrate vacuum energy. In other words, the focal point would be your point where you put, say, your resonant receiver. <laughs> or the rectenna. You know, it's basically a rectenna. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's a whole list. I have it. It's on our website, uh, Vacuum Engineers Toolkit. And it's given away for free. It's a one-pager, and it gives a citation for every one of the titles of all these weird tricks that you can perform. Uh, magnetism is another one. Uh, temperature change is another one. Um, voltage. A lot of them came from Milani's book. Uh, a mirror. You can actually put a mirror near your experiment and actually get an amplification effect. So it's amazing. I, I was so impressed with all these tricks. I figured, hey, maybe we can start using one or two of them in, in conjunction with each other. And, and get some kind of a like push-pull idea. 
In other words, you have one experiment that produces a Casimir push, another one that pulls them together, and what if you can oscillate between them with a temperature change? So, anyways, it's, it's food for thought. Oh, our website is the Zero Point Energy. I'm sorry. It's good. <laughs> well, it's integrityresearchinstitute.org, and, and you could click on two places, either one. One is um, um, going to space. In fact, I can actually pull it up and point to it. Wow. Yeah. The power of, um, OK, why not, since we're talking about it here. And we have web connections. Even though the people at home won't see it, that's OK. They can also go to www.integrity. Yeah, the banquet should be at what, 7.30, I believe? 7. 7 o'clock. Okay. And Prince George's um, room? Okay. I don't know. It's <laughs> on the first floor, come in the main entrance, straight ahead down to the food court, and then you go diagonally, I guess, to the right past the banquet. Oh, so it's downstairs somewhere. Okay. There's our homepage. And, um, and if you were interested in zero point energy, um, you might be more interested in this 390 to 398 in June, but anyways, and all the people that cite us from around the world. Now we're 400. That's right. Well, July. That's what we're talking about. July's not up yet from Hawaii. Up here, we're about to post it. Um, okay, so the two places you go, you can go here, how to reach the start, or you can go to zero point energy utilization. And so once you go to the zero point energy utilization, um, the vacuum toolkit is somewhere down the line. Yep, there it is. Ta-da! Toolkit. See, I should have made this a slide. Tools for the vacuum engineer. Summary of, and it's on the last page of the book, too. I tell you page numbers and micro cantilever, flexible membrane displays casimir deflection. Micro laser, of course. Quantum coherence. I didn't even talk about that. But it changes the relative strength of emission and absorption in the cavity. I mean, you could spend all day just studying this stuff. It's a, each one is, is a paper by itself with, with fabulous conclusions. So, non abelian EM field may alter the speed of light of the object locally. So, anyways, two independent refractive indexes. Some of them are pretty sophisticated. Sound luminescence, of course, that I like a lot because it seems to tap zero point energy. In fact, there's a very interesting article. I should have mentioned this earlier. I had a few slides about it. There's an article from uh, Claudia Everleen from the University of Toronto who actually proved that sonoluminescence happens so quickly in picoseconds that it can't be from atomic transitions. And so she concludes in her paper that it has to be a quantum vacuum phenomenon uh, just because of the fact of the speed of, of uh, appearance. So Claudia Everleen is unique. Yeah, I cited in my book. What happens so quickly? The uh, sonoluminescence emission oh. from cavitation that they're talking about. But it's, it's a great proof of the fact that you're tapping the quantum vacuum because the radiation through, you know, is a telltale sign. <laughs> but I'd be happy to send a few copies of the Serpent Energy book to your group if you like. Okay, well, thank you very much, and um, I guess I'll stop sharing.